I'm gonna teach the scapegoat in a way that you probably have never heard before. So prepare yourselves. I want you to look at up. Um, also in my book, uh, LC, uh, shout out to uh, EJ. Um, he talks about, now listen to this, Satan is a scapegoat and ultimate sin bearer for us. So, and they use the Leviticus passage for that, right? Let's let's read what it says here. At Venice, at every level of Adventism, uh, teach that Satan is the scapegoat and sin bearer uh, referenced in Leviticus 16. Their official doctrinal statement of faith, Seventh-day Adventist believes, his, this is a quote from y'all, a careful examination of Leviticus 16 reveals that Azazel represents Satan, not Christ, as some have thought. This doctrine is closely tied to investigative judgment and is another unorthodox, and I would say heretical, heretical, let me put this on uh, sleepy mode uh, real quick. Let me put this on sleepy mode. Hopefully it's still, hopefully it's, oh, oh, it's still recording, okay. So I put it on sleepy mode because people was texting me. So real quick, and so it says, um, the doctrine is closely related to investigative judgment and is another unorthodox doctrine held by the SDA church. Adventists have tortured scripture, listen, to make Satan a scapegoat because Ellen G. White, look up Ellen G. White, the racist woman in the mid 1800s who. Uh, can we pause right there? Can you pause right there? All right. So, ah, guys, pray for me. I'm about to go in. Yeah. <laughs> pray for me. He spoke about how we have Seventh day Adventists have the wrong understanding of the scapegoat. We have the wrong understanding of the scapegoat. But let's see what the Bible says. Who is the scapegoat? Who is the scapegoat? Let's look it up. Now, I'm going to teach the scapegoat in a way that you probably have never heard before. So prepare yourselves. Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, right? And here at the Advent Defense League, we like to read the King James. But I think that the NIV just says this so much better. So don't kill me, Jason. I know you hate NIV. But <laughs> let's just read it what it says. In Matthew 18, verse 6, it says, If anyone causes one of these little ones to sin, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Did you guys notice that? If anyone causes you to sin, it would be better if they had a large millstone hung around their neck and dropped into the depths of the sea. It goes on to say, woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come. But woe to the person through whom they come. What does that mean? That means that, Jason, if you and I were in a store, right, and I saw a candy bar and I'm like, yo, Jason, go steal it. Go steal it. Please steal it. And you end up stealing it. God charges you, Jason, with theft. But you want to know who else God charges with sin? Me. Why is that? Because I'm the one that tempted you to do it. I'm the one that caused you to do it. Let's see what the Bible says in Luke 17. It says the same thing. One day Jesus said to his disciples, there will always be temptations to sin. But what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? So sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting. Then it says it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to sin. What does this mean? It means that in the judgment, pay attention to this one, guys. In the judgment, you will be judged not only for the sins that you committed, but you will be judged for all the sins that you caused. You will be judged for the sins that you committed and for the sins that you caused in the judgment. Now, notice it says it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck. 
Why did I highlight that? And what does this have to do with the scapegoat? Pay attention to that. They It will be better if they had a millstone tied around their neck. Do you guys know about this place mm. called Babylon? What does Revelation 18, 21 say? It says, and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, thus say, thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Did you notice that in Matthew 18 and in Luke 17, the Bible says that if you cause someone to sin, it would be better if you had a millstone tied around your neck. And then in Revelation, Babylon has a great millstone tied around their neck and it's thrown into the sea. You know, when Revelation is using the same exact language as other scriptures, it's trying to intertwine two concepts. So what is it saying here? The Bible is clearly saying that Babylon is going to be judged not only for the sins that Babylon committed, but Babylon is going to be judged for all the sins that Babylon caused. Does that make sense? Put a one in the chat if that makes sense. Babylon will be judged for the sins that it committed and the sins that it caused. All right. Now, here's the, the real question. The real question is this. Who is the king of Babylon? Who is the king of Babylon? What does Isaiah 14, 4 say? It says, thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of of Babylon and say, how hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased. But pay attention to who the Bible says the king of Babylon is. How art thou fallen from heaven? Who? O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Hold on one second. So we understand that Babylon is going to be judged for, by, for all the sins that it committed and all the sins that it caused. The king of Babylon is Lucifer. So Lucifer is going to be judged by all the sins that it com that he committed and all the sins that he caused. Does that make sense? So the Matthew 18 and Luke 17 verses, they were referring to people who tempt other people to sin. And that includes Lucifer, the king of Babylon. But now let's ask this question. What sins will Satan suffer for? We know that Satan is going to suffer for all the sins that he committed and caused. But what sins will he suffer for? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The Bible describes Satan as the God of this world. In other words, you know, his influence is over the entire world. It says in Ephesians 2, verse 2, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Hold on one second. So you mean to tell me that every single time someone sins, the spirit that was working in them to commit such a sin was the spirit of Satan? So the spirit of Satan was in them, which caused them to commit sin. Isaiah 14, verse six, 16 to 17. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? That did shake kingdoms? That made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof? that open not the house of his prisoners. Brethren, if we understand that Satan is going to be destroyed for all the sins that he caused, what sins did Satan cause? Every single sin from the time of Adam all the way to the second coming of Jesus, Satan will have to suffer for according to the principles that we learned in Matthew 18 and in Luke 17. If you cause someone to stumble, God's wrath is upon you. Right can I, now, can we do share we see the same concept elsewhere in scripture? In Genesis 3, 14, you remember when Adam and Eve sinned? It says, and the Lord said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled in me and I did eat. And the Lord said unto serpent, to the serpent, because 
thou hast done this, thou art cursed. Now, using my imagination, I can almost imagine Satan saying like, what, me? I didn't eat from the fruit. I'm the one that gave Eve the fruit to eat, but I didn't eat it. So how are you going to curse me when I'm not the one that ate the fruit? Because you're the one that instigated it. You're the one that caused it. You're the one that tempted her to do it. And so God curses those who tempt others to sin as well. Right? Now, here's another question, another obje obje objection. Why do we call Satan a sin bearer? Why do we call him a sin bearer? Let's see what the Bible says in Ezekiel 18, 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. What is this verse teaching us? What is this verse teaching us? This verse is teaching us that... When someone commits wickedness, the Bible describes it as them bearing that wickedness. You bear the wickedness that you cause. Let's read elsewhere in scripture. But the man that is clean, and I love this verse. So pay attention to this verse. But the man that is clean, that is not in a journey and forbearance to keep the Passover, even the same soul shall be cut off from among his people because he brought not the offering of the Lord in his appointed season. And the, that man shall, that man shall bear his sin. So what is this talking about? This is talking about the Passover. We understand as Bible scholars that the Passover represents the cross. Now the Bible is saying right here, if someone did not participate in the Passover, they will have to bear their own sin. If someone does not participate in the Passover, they will have to bear their own sin. What does this mean? What is a modern day understanding of this? If we do not accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and we do not transfer our sins to the cross that bears our sin, at the judgment, we will have to bear our own sin. But then we read that we are not only going to bear the sins that we committed, but we're going to bear the sins that we caused. Leviticus 5.17 says the same thing. Yet is he guilty and he shall bear his iniquity. Oh, guys, pay attention to this, please. Pay attention to this verse. Because this is one of the clearest verses to explain why we call Satan a sin bearer. Because they ministered unto them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall in iniquity. Therefore, I lifted up my hand against them, saith the Lord God, they shall bear their iniquity. So God is saying that if you cause someone to commit a sin, you will bear iniquity for causing someone to commit sin. If you cause someone to commit sin, you will bear iniquity. Why do we call Satan a sin bearer? Because he's the one that caused all the sin of the world. And the Bible clearly says that he will bear the iniquity if he caused all the sin of the world. Now he brought up Leviticus 16. I didn't even get to Leviticus 16 yet, but let's go there. Let's go there. Leviticus chapter 16. Let's start reading. It says, in verse 5, and he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goat for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So we're there, we have two goats here. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. So we have one lot as the Lord's goat, the other lot for the scapegoat. Let's continue reading. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. Very important. Don't miss that point. The Lord's goat is for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go 
for a scapegoat where? Into the wilderness. Very important. Let's keep on reading. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering. So the, the Lord's goat is killed. That is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So notice something right here. Notice something. Notice that when the Lord's goat is killed, the people are cleansed. So the people are already cleansed by the time the scapegoat comes into play. Let's continue to read. And when he had made an end of reconciling, the, so when the reconciliation is already complete and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. So he's already cleansed the people. Now the scapegoat comes into play. And Aaron shall lay both of his hands upon the head of the scapegoat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel. Didn't we speak about earlier that someone that someone at the end, after the saints are cleansed, are going to have all the iniquities placed upon him? I wonder who that person is. Let's continue hmm. to read. Of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and, and shall send him away by the hand of a man into the wilderness. So now let's break it down. We have two goats. We have the first goat. We have the second goat. Who's the first goat? The first goat is called the Lord's goat. The second goat is called the scapegoat. But that also means Azazel. The first goat cleanses and reconciles the people. Very important. The the second goat, the scapegoat, the sins are placed upon his head after the people are cleansed. Very important. <laughs> the first goat dies for the people, but the second goat is exiled outside of the camp of the people. Who does the first goat represent? Romans 10 verse 9, that if, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that the Lord, Je the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We know that the Lord's goat represents the Lord. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we know that the first goat was killed and his blood was sprinkled, and it cleansed the sanctuary. Matches the description of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 5 verse 3, 15 verse 3, or what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. We understand that the first goat represents Christ. But who does the second goat represent? So we understand that the second goat, his name is Azazel. Who is Azazel? Azazel in Jewish legends, a demon or evil spirit to whom the ancient rite of Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, a scapegoat was sent bearing the sins of the Jewish people. So are we saying that Jesus is a demon or has the name of demon? Let's continue to read. Sins are placed upon his head after the people are cleansed. Notice that the sins are placed on the head of the scapegoat after the sins of the people are cleansed. So we understand that the first goal represents Christ. Isn't that true? And Christ died for our sins. But let me ask you guys this question. How many times did Jesus bear our sin? How many times did Christ bear our sins? Once. Jesus died for our sins mm -hmm. once, didn't he? Mm -hmm. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath suffered, also hath once suffered, for sins. Christ bore the sins of the world one time, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So notice something. A lot of the times people, they argue that, oh, seven-day Adventists, you guys believe that it wasn't finished at the cross. No, you guys believe that it wasn't finished at the cross because we preach that Christ 
is the first goat that after the first goat is killed, the reconciliation is complete. But when you say that Christ is the scapegoat, what you're saying is that Christ has to bear the sins of the world twice. When we know that Christ once suffered for sins and the, the atonement made on the cross was sufficient for salvation. Let's That's right. That's exactly right. Let's continue to read, right? We understand that the sins were placed upon the head of the scapegoat. That's very important. Now let's look at this. The sins are placed upon the head of the scapegoat. Let the enemy, who's the enemy? It's Satan, right? Persecute my soul and take it. Yea, let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay my honor into the dust. So we're speaking about the devil here. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous God trieth the hearts and the reins. Let's look up what that word trieth means in the concordance. Because our critics said that, oh, we, we understand that the idea of Satan being a scapegoat is closely tied to the investigative judgment. I agree. Let's look at what that word trieth means. It means to investigate, examine, prove, or try. Let's continue to read. Psalms chapter 7. So we're... we're so just, just to put it into context, we're in the context of an investigative judgment, according to the previous verse. Verse 15, he made a pit and digged it and is fallen into the ditch which he made. What does that mean? Why is that important? He made a pit and digged it and fell into the ditch which he made. Isaiah chapter 14, speaking about Satan, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Hold on, he made a pit? Is it is that speaking about Satan? I think it is. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee saying, is this the man that made the earth tremble, that did, she, that did shake the kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness? Hold on. He made a ditch, he made a pit and digged it and it's fallen into the ditch which he made. So Satan made the world a wilderness, right? Psalm 7, verse 16, what's going to happen to Satan? His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come upon his own plate. Guys, Satan's own mischief will come upon his own head, just like the scapegoat. Come on, preacher. Come on. Do you guys know the story of Esther? Mm -hmm. Y'all ever read the story of Esther? Hmm. Favorite woman in the Bible. Man. Yeah, y'all want to know something interesting about the story of Esther? In Esther chapter 7, verse 6. Well, by the way, just to give a little context, in the book of Esther, there are two powers at play. There's Haman and there's Esther. Now, Haman is described as a man filled with pride, and he wants Mordecai to worship him. You know, he wants worship. He, he's, a, he's not a, a really good guy, and he's the enemy of the Jewish people. And mm -hmm. Esther said the adversary, the enemy, is the wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. Don't we understand that Haman in the story represents the devil? Mm-hmm. Yep. Who does Haman represent in the story? It's clearly the devil. He's the adversary. He's the enemy. Well, but pay well. attention to what's going to happen to the devil in the story of the book of Esther. Come on, preacher. I'm when playing. Esther came before the king, he commanded by letters that his wicked device, which he devised against the Jews, shall return upon his own head. Come on. Come on. That's powerful. Shall return <laughs> upon his own head. Get him, Haman, Dave. the Get devil him. in the story, his iniquity returns upon his own head. Come on. You want to know something interesting about the book of Esther? Mm -hmm. Did you know that Esther actually represents the first goat, the Lord's goat? Why is that? Because she comes before the king with an attitude of, if I die, I die. So she, she risks her life. Yeah, she's willing to sacrifice her life for the people. Come on, preacher. Come on. The first goat. But Come what on. happens after the first goat is killed? 
The Come second oath, the scapegoat has the sins placed upon his own head. So on. after Esther comes before the king with the attitude of if I die, I die, that's oh, yeah, yeah. after that, the mm -hmm. sins are placed upon the head of Amen. Mm -hmm. There's a clear connection here. My God, my God. We mm -hmm. also read mm -hmm. in Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Come on. It, um, it shall it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, when we look at this word bruise in the concordance, it actually means to crush or to destroy. So we mm. understand that there was a fulfillment of this at the cross, that Jesus crushed the head of the serpent at the cross. But there's also a dual application to this. There's a dual application to this <laughs> because this speaks about the fact that God is going to destroy Satan. He's going to kill him. But how is God going to kill him in the end? It says that God is going to crush his head. So we understand from Esther that the sins were placed upon the head. We understand in Genesis 3.15 that the Satan's head is going to be crushed. We understand in Psalms chapter 7 that his own wickedness is going to fall upon his own head. Come on, let's continue to read this. Leviticus 24, 14. What does it say? It says, in this story of Leviticus 24, there was a boy in the camp of Israel that cursed God. Pay attention to what happened to this boy. Bring out of the camp the one who cursed. Very important. He's out of the camp. He's mm -hmm. out of the camp. And <laughs> let all who heard him lay their hands on his Head. head. Oh, man. Head. That's a powerful yeah. parallel. And Get let Get all the congregation yeah. stone him. Come on. So someone is going to be outside of the camp in whom the sin or in whom people place their hands upon his head, symbolically speaking, and he is going to be destroyed outside of the camp. Does this match Jesus Christ? Let's see. Let's see if this actually matches Jesus Christ. We know that the second goat is exiled outside of the camp of the people. Is Jesus going to return to the people? Is Jesus going to return to the camp? The Bible says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Also, which pierced him, and all the kindred of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. The Bible says it clearly that Jesus is going to come again. Jesus is not going to stay outside of the camp. He's going to come inside of the camp and mingle with the people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But let's read it again. Wait, Bring can can we can we just add to that Hebrews chapter nine verse twenty eight? Add to it, bro. Add to it. Hebrews chapter nine verse twenty eight says this about Jesus. It says this. So Christ once suffered to bear the sins of many. Mom. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin. Without sin. salvation. Come on. Can, can, can you still has his, his his sins on him? Mm -hmm. Wait, can you, can, you go to verse, can you go to verse 26? 26, to same says, chapter. Same chapter. It says, For then must he often suffer since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world he hath appeared to put away sin. How? By, by being the kept alive sacrifice. In the wilderness, no, no, by no. By the sacrifice. Notice that it says, put away. A lot of the critics like to say, oh, it has to be Jesus, the scapegoat, because he takes Come away on, preacher. Come on. sins. No, no, no. The way Come he on. takes away sin is by that Lord's goat who is sacrificed. Put mm -hmm. away sin Come on. by the sacrifice of himself. My God. Amen. My God. Yo. <laughs> Guys. This has been an amazing study. We're about to close it all. Remember how it says that, that this person is going to be destroyed outside of the camp after they lay their hands upon his head? Mm -hmm. Does this match the description of Satan? Revelation chapter 20, verse 9. And they went up to the breadth of the earth, speaking about Satan, and it come past the what? The camp. Of the saints. They come past the camp of the saints about. 
and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Guys, just like this person in Leviticus 24, 14, that was destroyed outside of the camp in the same exact way, Satan being outside of the camp is going to be destroyed. The second goat represents none other than Satan. It represents none other than Satan. It cannot represent Christ. Brother. Wait, 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 wait. I got to add to this, man. I got to add to this. Go back to Revelation chapter 20. Jay, pull it up real quick. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Coming right up. Let's go a few verses before. A few verses before the one that Deontay brought up. I want you to yep. notice something very carefully. Go, go, to verse, go to verse one. Go to verse one real quick. Let me ask you a question. Is there somebody who holds on to the scapegoat and leads him out into the wilderness? A Isn't strong that? man. Yeah. Is there Isn't somebody who holds on to the devil in this verse and leads him in a certain place? Yep. Yeah. Who is the one who's being led in verse two? And he no. laid hold on the dragon. Oh, let me read it carefully. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold as if he was holding him like mm. a goat or something, right? Yeah. He laid hold mm. on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the mm. devil and Satan, mm. and bound mm. him a thousand years. All right. Mm. Now check this out. Gonna, are you just going to hold him like as if he's a goat or something? Right. Like, that's just right. <laughs> now watch, watch this, though, because this verse directly tells you who it is. If you want to know who the scapegoat is, here it is right here in verse two. You see a very clear parallel between what's happening to the scapegoat in Leviticus chapter 16 and what's happening to Lucifer in Revelation chapter 20. In the same way the scapegoat is being bound and led away into a wilderness in Leviticus 16, the devil is being bound by a strong angel and led away into the wilderness of the earth at that time. Mm -hmm. The bottomless pit. If you do a careful study, you know that the earth will be will be completely desolate for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. While we're in heaven for that thousand years, yeah. the earth is made yeah. desolate. We read that in Jeremiah. We read that in many many verses, right? So we see a very direct parallel between Leviticus sixteen and the scapegoat and Revelation chapter twenty. And the answer as to who is that that scapegoat represent is right here in Revelation chapter twenty verse two. The devil. Can't, it, it's so clear, it tells you twice. The devil and Satan. That's who he represents yeah. because of that direct parallel right there. And Come you know what's on. interesting? I'll, I'll give you one more verse. To the one that Le Leviticus 23, 14, where Deontay went to, that parallel with that, that person who was stoned at that time is so strong in, in Leviticus 20, 24, verse 14. Notice this, verse 14. But now look at verse 15. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whoso curses his God, like that guy did, shall, what's the word? Bear his sin. Bear his sin. Just like the devil. Mercy. Oof. Just like the devil who bears the uh -huh. sins. Whosoever uh -huh. curses his father shall bear his sins. And let me tell you something. The Bible tells us, Paul tells us in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 15, 4, he Come says on. that whatever was written in the past was written for our learning. So when Deontay references Leviticus 24, the story there, and, and the book of Esther and Psalm 7, all these things were written for us and for our learning. Yeah, They teach us. They teach those of us who are living in the last days. And we see a direct parallel in Revelation chapter 20. It is very clear. That the one who's being led away by a fit man into the wilderness of the earth in Revelation chapter 20 is none other mm -hmm. than the devil himself. The Bible mm -hmm. tells you. So guess what? The Bible directly tells you. Amen. And, you know, I just want to add to that point that uh, Deontay was making about the devil being in the wilderness, even. Like, the Bible makes it very plain what the condition of the world would be like af after the second coming. It says, the slain of the Lord shall be from one corner of the earth to the other. Um, everybody's slain, all the wicked is slain by the brightness of his coming. But look what it says in Jeremiah chapter 4. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, 
and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a what? Was a wilderness. A wilderness. A wilderness. So the, the time that God comes to gather his people, Satan is being left with no man in the wilderness. And all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. For thus saith the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate. Yet will I not make a full end. And then you'll see like he, he restores it after that. But this time when Jesus comes back to gather his saints, the whole world is going to be the wilderness. And the only one that's being held like a goat at that time is Satan. Let me let me add another uh, a couple of a few other points to this. You know, Deontay, you made some really, really um, awesome points because people need to understand what we're saying when we're saying that Satan bears sins. And let's look at the statements um, more clearly. Right. We, we talked about the, the fundamental belief number four. But <clears throat> this is what Ellen White said. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by washing of regeneration and um, renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let no one try to carry his own sins, for they have been atoned for by the great sin bearer. The only begotten Son of God voluntarily met the claims of God's violated law. Amen. People, critics are saying, oh, they think Satan is their sin bearer. No, our official statements say that Jesus Christ is our sin bearer. There's a few more. No one who believes in Jesus Christ is under bondage to the law of God, for his law is the law of life, not of death. To those who obey his precepts, all who comprehend the spirituality of the law, all who realize its power as a detector of sin are in just as a helpless uh, condition as Satan himself. Unless they accept the mm -hmm. atonement provided for them in the remedial sacrifice of Jesus Christ, who is our mm -hmm. atonement at one minute with God. In his intercession as our advocate, Christ needs no man's virtue, no man's intercession. He is the only sin bearer, the only sin offering. These are our official statements about Jesus Christ. He is our sin bearer, our sin offering. How hard poor mortals strive to be sin bearers for themselves and for others. But the only sin bearer is Jesus Christ. He alone can be my substitute and sin bearer. The forerunner of Christ exclaimed, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Pro, pro, uh, I think this is the last quote I had. Proclaim remission of sins through Christ, the only sin bearer, the only sin partner. Like you get, you get the point. I bring that up because um, what is it that Satan is actually doing? Well, actually, you know what? Let me show you another quote. <laughs> this is the quote that he's actually getting it from. It says this, in the typical service, the high priest, having made the atonement for Israel, came forth and blessed the congregation. So Christ, at the close of his work, notice this is the time, at the close of his work as mediator will appear without sin unto salvation, Hebrews 9, 28, to bless his waiting people as with, with eternal life. As the priest in the removing the sins from the sanctuary confessed them upon the head of the scapegoat, so Christ will place all the sins upon Satan, the originator and the instigator of sin. The scapegoat bearing the sins of Israel was sent away into a land uninhabited. So Satan bearing the guilt, notice, and hold on to that word guilt, bearing the guilt of all the sins which he has called God's people to commit. The ones he had caused God's people to commit. Deontay, you had perfectly said that. Will be for a thousand years confined to the earth, which will then be desolate without inhabitant, and he will at last suffer the full penalty of sin and the fires that shall destroy all the wicked. Thus, the great plan of redemption will reach its accomplishment in the final eradication of sin and the deliverance of all who have been willing to renounce evil. I'm saying all this, and I know we're going to be closing soon, but I'm saying all this because I wanted to really make it very clear what Satan is doing is um in line with what the bible is saying satan is not redeeming us his part in this is not about taking our sins and dying for us because he doesn't die but what he's doing is taking all the sins 
that he caused. And Deontay, what you showed was absolutely amazing because the Bible does show that he bears the sins that he causes. I'm going to show you a couple of verses and I'm going to also um, reiterate some of the verses that um, Deontay showed. So Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17 says this. This is a principle. Thou shall not hate thy brother in thine heart. Does Satan hate us? Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. You may look at this verse and say, what does this have to do with anything? Well, this verse is saying, if you don't tell your neighbor what they're doing is wrong as far as sin, you're going to suffer sin upon them. If you look at this in the New King James Version, and this is one of the few times I like the New King James Version, it says this, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. Actually, if that's not clear, this is NIV. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in their guilt. What Ellen White was Versus. saying is that he is getting their guilt. New Living Translation. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. What this mm. is basically saying is that Satan is being held guilty for all the sins that he led people to do. And you could just read how, how many other ways this Bible verse um, breaks that down, you know. And as a matter of fact, just getting back to the Bible, because I, I want to make this really, really quick. John 8, 44 says this. You are of the, your father, the devil, and the desires of yeah. your father you want to do. Let me get the King James for this. Sorry. Sorry, Edwin. <laughs> you are of your you. father the devil and the lust of your father you will do he was a what from the beginning a murderer, murderer. from the beginning a bold not in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaketh a lie he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it right mm -hmm. and how was he a murderer from the beginning first john chapter 3 verse 15 says this whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer and yeah. you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So we read mm -hmm. in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17, that if you hate your brother and you don't tell him his sin, you're going to bear his sins. He did that. In our first parents, he, he made them commit sin. If that wasn't clear enough for you, let me give you four more verses and then I'll be very, very quiet. So this is a verse that Deontay had gave earlier. And I just want to make sure that this point is not missed on us. Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 12. This should be our memory verse. It says this, because they ministered unto them before their idols. And what did they do? They caused the house of caused Israel to house. fall in iniquity. These people caused God's people to sin. Therefore, I have lifted up my hand against them, saith the Lord God, and they shall bear their iniquity. God is making it very, very plain that if you cause people to sin, which is what Satan does, he's going to be the bearer of their sins. That's what we're saying about the scapegoat. There's another verse that we can use. Proverbs 28, verse 10. Look at this one. It says this. Whoso causes the righteous to go astray, causing the righteous to sin in an evil way, he shall fall in himself into his own Oh, that that just blew my mind. Didn't we just read that Satan is going to fall into a pit in Isaiah chapter 14? But the upright shall have good things in possession. Yes, when you cause somebody to sin, you're bearing their sins in the end. And the Bible saying that's you building your own pit. And that's exactly yeah. what Satan did. Proverbs chapter 26, yeah. verse 27 says this. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein and he yeah. that rolleth a stone it will return upon it him will. hold on a second do you know anybody who rolled a stone in the bible hmm. did not jesus have a stone rolled on his grave was not God. satan in charge of killing jesus 
Regardless, whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. Yes, it was the soldiers in the Bible, but Satan was definitely in those soldiers. And I'm going to bring this back to that verse that Deontay had shared earlier. We see that when you cause people to sin, the sins come back on you and you're going to bear them. And it's as if you're digging your own pit. And so I'm just going to highlight these verses. Behold, he travaileth with iniquity. That is Satan. And have conceived mischief. That is Satan. And brought forth falsehood. That is Satan. He made a pit, meaning he tricked people to being sin. That is Satan. And digged it. That's Satan. And has fallen into the ditch which he made. Again, that is Satan. His mischief shall return upon his own head. And his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. So I just wanted to share that, that yes, it's indeed 100% fact that Satan is the one that the scapegoat represents. But just for fun, I want to explain the scenario of, of how people understand the scapegoat. So when you read Leviticus chapter 16, this is the order. The order is simply this, that <clears throat> God, the, the high priest, he finishes the reconciliation. Right? You go to Leviticus chapter 16. This is the order. Um, Leviticus chapter 16. Right? He brings a live goat in verse 16, and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and their transgressions and their sins. Right? And then it says, and when he have made an end of reconciling the holy place, if we understand that the high priest is done by this point, uh, H3722, when he it says he's finished reconciling, that really means he finished the atonement. He finished cleansing. He finished the atonement. The atonement is done after he's done with the um, reconciling. After the people's sins are already dealt with, then he brings a live goat. Are you telling That's me right. that Jesus yeah. is taking, finished all the atonement, finished the, the dying, finished the, the work in the most holy place? He's going to now come out and say, all right. Let me go grab myself and put the sins again on my head and go into a wilderness. Because what happens next? When you look at the end of what happens in Leviticus chapter 16, right? You see that he's getting the, the, the live goat. He's putting his heads on, on, on it, right? And then he's going to be bearing all their sins in the land uninhabited. He's going to go into the wilderness, right? And then what is the next thing that we see? And he shall wash his flesh in the water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make an atonement for himself. And the fat of the sin, of, of the fat of the sin offering shall he burn upon the altar. When you read the rest of the chapter, you're seeing that the next thing that is happening with that goat, he goes into the wilderness and everything in the wilderness is burnt up. How does it make sense that Jesus, when he's finished with his work in the most holy place, is going to come back and say, let me put the sins on my head and go into the wilderness where there's burning and be burnt up? Are we saying that Jesus is going into the wilderness to be burnt up? Who is going to the wilderness to be burnt up? It can only be Satan. So I just want to say that. Yeah. No other interpretation makes sense. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll add one more verse and then I'll answer a question that came in in the comments real quick. I'll be I'll be quick, Yante. Uh Romans chapter one, verse 32. I don't know if this verse was brought up. It was a moment I had to kind of step away. But uh, in case it wasn't, I just wanted to point it out. Verse 23, uh, 30, 32, pardon. It says, the whole context speaking about the wicked and the wick, their wicked acts and all of that. And then it says, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. But then it says, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Does the devil have pleasure in them that do them? Does he have pleasure in the wickedness yeah. that they commit? Yeah. Well, guess what? He will yeah. also be worthy of death due to the same sins, even if he's not himself committing it, but by the simple fact that he approves of them, as another translation says, or has pleasure in them as well. So I just don't know if that verse was brought up, but I thought I'd just bring it up real quick. Um, let yeah. me... Let me answer this uh, here real quick. Um, 
Karshan brought this, this quotation up. This is a quotation in the writings of Ellen White where it says, some apply the solemn type to scapegoat to Satan. This cannot, this is not correct. He cannot bear his own sins. At the choosing of Barabbas, Pilate washed his hands. He cannot be represented as a scapegoat. Um, if you do a little research at the White Estate, you're going to find that from their uh, investigation, they have found that this quotation is in question. It's uh, and they're not exactly sure. It, some say that it's just notes that she had put down. Others say that it's not necessarily att attributed to her. They're not 100% sure where this quote from. So what the White Estate teaches is that instead of taking this quotation and pitting it against the dozens of dozens of times where she says that Satan does represent the scapegoat, or the scapegoat does represent Satan, then um, they take what everything else that she says to the opposite of this. It's almost like saying you, you can't take one thing to destroy the 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 hundred the 99 pieces of evidence. You can't say that that one is going to destroy everything else. You got to harmonize or figure out what's going on with that one, right? So basically, it, the idea is that they're not exactly sure that this quote is um, legitimate or that it's if it's something her her thoughts kind of just taking notes uh, as she formulated her thoughts of some sort. Even the quote itself, it's sort of jumbled together with different thoughts at the choosing of Satan, Pilate washed his hands. Um, so it, it almost doesn't make too much, too much sense. So that's, there's a lot of doubt regarding that quotation. I would say, um, it's better to look at what the rest of what she had to say on it. Yeah. So Satan it is, is a scapegoat. I mean, again, you have to look at the order on what happened on the Day of Atonement. The the Bible tells us that he finished reconciling in the most holy place. Oh. Are we going and and it tells us he's going to come without sin. Like the scapegoat did not die. The scapegoat has the sin on him in the wilderness. Nothing in Scripture speaks of Jesus going to the wilderness, but rather Jesus, the high priest. You know. It tells us that what he does, and he places all those sins on the head of the scapegoat, and the scapegoat goes into the wilderness, and the priest comes back into the camp without sin. That's what the Bible says is happening to Jesus.